Hi, my name is Michael Rakowitz. I'm an artist from Chicago, and I'm happy to be here in Seoul. So the title of this exhibition is The Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist, and this is a, a title that's applied to this ongoing work that I began in 2006 with a team of assistants in my studio where we've been reappearing the more than 8,000 artifacts that are still listed as missing, stolen, or status unknown uh, after the um, U.S. invasion in uh, 2003. So all of these items that were looted from the Iraq Museum are, are part of the beginning of the work, and unfortunately it's extended to now include the archaeological sites that were destroyed by ISIS in 2015. Uh, the title of the, the project actually comes from a translation of the processional way, the avenue that ran through the Ishtar Gate in Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. And so in Babylonian it was Arjibor Shapu, and when you translate that it means the invisible enemy should not exist. And it was like the coolest name of a street that I've ever heard. And it also was so poetic in being able to apply to the situation. It was almost like a Jenny Holzer truism. And it brings together what is now uh, 17 years of work that's involved uh, more than 40 different uh, artists, assistants that I've had the, the pleasure and the honor of working with in Chicago. The materials that I've been using to make this work since 2006 are the packaging of Middle Eastern foodstuffs that one finds in the U.S. Where there, wherever there is an Arab community, and also the English Arabic newspapers that are given away for free in many of those groceries where one buys that food. And those newspapers are usually catering to newly arrived emigres and refugees and asylum seekers. So in the midst of these articles about current events, you also have these advertisements for uh, lawyers to represent your asylum case, um, where to find cheap housing uh, if you're not happy with the resettlement housing that you've been given, all these different kinds of daily life uh, situations that, that newly arrived migrants have to navigate in their new home. And for me, it comes out of my own history of growing up as, in, uh, as, as a, the grandchild of uh, Iraqi Jewish emigres, my mother as well, who came over with um, my, my grandmother and my grandfather from Iraq in 1947. So she left um, Bombay where she was born at the age of two. But the house that I grew up in was steeped in that Iraqi Jewish uh, culture. And it was something that was very beautiful to me because um, for us it was just normal. And uh, my grandparents succeeded in, in taking the best of the things from the place that they loved. They loved being Baghdadi. Um, and then when, when they were more or less forced to leave because the political tides were turning, they made the decision not to leave everything behind, but to create a space in their home where we could all relate in some ways to this place that we, we weren't able to go back to. And so I always talk about how my grandparents were like the first installation artists that I've ever met, ever met because everything that was on the walls was from Iraq, what was on the floors was from Iraq. What came out of the stereo during family parties was from Iraq and what came out of the kitchen was most definitely from Iraq. And so it's like before Rachel White Reed had cast a house in concrete, my grandmother had cast the house in, in cumin and the smells of cumin. And, um, and so for me, these materials are that echo. So it is about visibility. Um, so when we talk about the invisible enemy should not exist, one of the things is that my team and I are reappearing these things that are all intents and purposes uh, invisible. And that invisibility is uh, echoed in the products that are somehow too terrified to tell you where they're from. One of the things that 
you'll see here at Barakat Contemporary is that we reappeared sections of room F and room S of the Northwest Palace of Kalhu, which is the Assyrian name for what people have also called Nimrud. Um, but the way in which this project works is that my assistants and I, we reappear uh, the entire footprint of that section of the room, so it's life size. And what one sees here in the exhibition is what was destroyed by ISIS in 2015. However, what's also reappeared here are the gaps and the empty spaces that Iraqis have had to look through uh, when they look at their culture in a place like the Northwest Palace. There were 600 reliefs that were in this palace that was built by Asha Nasser Pal. And the, the, of the 600, 400 were actually excavated and extracted to be taken to uh, museums in the global north and in the west. What was left behind were 200 of those 600. So what my studio and I have been reappearing are those 200 that are now um, fragments. Um, but what you also see are those empty spaces. And along with the empty spaces, one sees the labels that tell you exactly where those pieces are. So anything that you don't see in here actually exists, but it exists outside of Iraq. So it puts the viewer into the position of an Iraqi who might have been inside the Northwest Palace of Kalhu the day before ISIS destroyed it, and to see all the different holes and the fragments through which Iraqis have had to look at their culture um, for the last 150 plus years since those excavations began in the mid 1800s. There's also a certain amount of invisibility that one finds in the vitrines um, of, say, the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago, um, with whom I collaborated to make this video called The Ballad of Special Ops Cody. And what, what The Ballad of Special Ops Cody does is it brings a, a doll that was essentially a votive statue meant to recreate the appearance of deployed parents or brothers or uncles or other relatives or friends um, who were in Iraq uh, during the 2003 US-led invasion. And they made them in all different likenesses. So they had uh, dolls that were made, uh, that were male, that were female, um, that had all different kinds of uh, racial and ethnic uh, characteristics. And when, this, when I read about this hoax that the Mujahideen brigades had actually pulled off in 2005, where they took a picture of one of those dolls and it, they made it seem like it was a hostage. Um, and it more or less 24 hours created a, a circumstance where the U.S. Central Command was trying to find this soldier who had been captured. Um, it made me understand that, uh, that this, this doll had a relationship to these votive statues that one finds in places like the vitrines of the Oriental Institute or at the Met or the Louvre or the British Museum. And those votive statues were actually used by worshipers who would go to the temple and they would go and pray. But the idea is that this statue with these clasped hands was a surrogate for the person who was praying. And you would leave it and the idea was, was still praying for you even after you left and the blessings would always reach you. And so as I thought about these dolls being surrogates for the deployed relatives in Iraq, I started to wonder what would that votive statue from 2005 AD say to a votive statue from 2005 BC. And so the idea was to kind of create something that wasn't necessarily visible um, in those vitrines to recognize the fact that these kinds of belief systems and the, the kind of power that objects hold as, um, as something like a relic, you know, where it's almost like too powerful for the body and so you entrust it to an object. 
um, and to also understand that um, that the conversation that's created between this doll, uh, which is voiced by a U.S. war veteran named Jin Miguel Prather, is speaking these truths in this museum context across time. And you start to realize that all of these different objects were, were objects that have been conquered, pilfered, redistributed, pilfered again, and, um, and they both come from empire. So that was one of the things that I think really kind of emerged in what Jin ended up speaking all in her own words in one take when she saw what the doll would be looking at. The project Return has its roots in my own family history of knowing that the date has always been important to, uh, to Iraqi Jewish families, especially because the date in Iraq is considered by many to be the best in the world. Um, there's over 600 different varieties of dates that grow in Iraq, and it was the chief exporter of dates in the world uh, at its height in the 1970s. And so it accounted for the second largest export next to oil. And um, in the 1970s, there were over 30 million date palms throughout the country. And at the end of the Iran-Iraq war, that number was halved to about 16 million. And the numbers after the 2003 US-led invasion uh, put it at around 3 million. And so the, the date palms suffered the same fate as the humans. And a lot of the reasons for the decline have to do with uh, the munitions that were dropped on the soil and the kind of illnesses that it really brought to different, different uh, kinds of uh, flora throughout the, the country. And when I started to understand the metaphor and the, the powerful symbolism that the date had in, in Iraq, it of course made me think about my own family. And one of the stories that I tell is that date syrup was made by hand by my grandfather. Um, who died in 1975, and he left behind like a freezer full of jars. Um, and somewhere in the 1980s, we ate the last jar, and my mother then, you know, would have to buy it at the store, and the brands were usually from California, from Israel. And uh, my mother said it never quite captured the same kind of intensity or the texture and the flavor that my grandfather's had. And so uh, in 2004, I was living in Brooklyn with my wife and um, we were very close to Sahadi Importing Company, which was the place my grandparents went to when they came from, uh, from when, they, when they first arrived to the United States and that's where they went to to get their spices and their food. So the family, the Sahadi family has known my family, you know, in this kind of passing way as customers since then. And so one day I went to the grocery and I saw that uh, there was this can of date syrup, uh, second house products, and it was listed as product of Lebanon. And I thought to myself, let me buy this can as a gift to my mom and see if it's any different. And uh, when I brought it to the counter, Charlie Sahadi looked at the can and he looked at me and he said, your mother's going to love this. It's from Baghdad. And when I looked at the label again to make sure I wasn't going crazy and I saw it said Lebanon, I asked him to explain and he said the date syrup is processed in the Iraqi capital. It's put into these large plastic vats. It then gets driven over the border to Syria where it gets put into these tin plate steel cans and then it gets brought over to the border to Lebanon where it gets labeled and is sold to the rest of the world. And this was how those Iraqi date companies were able to circumvent the UN sanctions for all those years. But this was 2004, a year after the sanctions had apparently been lifted. And Charlie explained to me that it was because of the prohibitive charges, you know, that they would have to undergo intensive scanning from Homeland Security, the USDA, the US FDA. And this was something that it, as a charge would have to be absorbed by the importer. And a while after learning this, I came back with this idea to reopen my grandfather's import-export company, 
that he had in Baghdad, and then he reopened in the United States when he got there. And my desire was to import Iraqi dates to the U.S. for the first time in decades, and to have it say, actually, product of Iraq, without it being hidden, without it being invisible. And uh, that was when Charlie Sahadi looked at me like I was crazy and said, it's really bad business. And I said, well, it could be really good art. And so this is a project where the dates end up in the traffic of hundreds of thousands of refugees that were looking to flee Iraq during the insurgency in 2006. And so it ends up sharing the same fate of many of the people where it gets detained for weeks and weeks and eventually they end up spoiling in the hot truck. And so it ends up being, for me, a surrogate for the Iraqi people um, who are not able to leave, uh, whose fates are somewhere in between places. And it's certainly something that we still see happening today. And it ends up being um, bittersweet because uh, even though we succeeded in airlifting out 10 boxes of those dates, to come to my store, um, one of the things that the, that the exporters were telling me uh, was that it, it makes all the sense in the world to them that I, as somebody who comes from Iraqi ancestors, would want to import Iraqi dates because he says, uh, they said, uh, every Iraqi has a date in their genes. And it is customary in some parts of Iraq to put a date into the mouth of a newborn baby so the first taste of life is sweet. And so these projects in making the invisible uh, visible and tangible as a ghost, um, it makes it reappear. Um, and that's what a ghost does. It appears, disappears, and reappears again. And so it does become this haunting through objecthood, through taste and through being, and hopefully it's a harbinger of sweeter times to come.